He was several things from a criminal to a musician to finally a cult leader. He ordered several murders just for the thrill. But was he born to kill? Let's find out right now. Tuesday, my Cajun cuties. Yes, it's me, Anne Marie, aka the Cajun Crime Queen from Carrico, Louisiana. Cajun born, Cajun bred. When I die, I'll be Cajun dead. I hope after this video that you like, subscribe, and comment. And don't forget to press on that notification bell so you never miss a video from me, Anne Marie. I hope you have a beverage. I hope you have a snuggle partner or a snuggle fur partner. Those are the best. And you're ready to hear a true crime story with yours truly and as always how are y'all doing on this beautiful tuesday evening i am so happy that you decided to join me tonight as we are going to dig deep into a case and this case that we are working on tonight has not one not two but three parts that's how much i dug deep into this case and as always, I want to know, are y'all drinking y'all water? Are y'all staying hydrated? Are y'all getting those tickers up? Are y'all going for brisk 20, 30 minute walks every day? Remember, just a quick walk in the morning, get those endorphins up, and you are going to have an amazing day. I promise you. And we are going to discuss someone that needs absolutely no introduction because everyone knows who he is. As several of you know, I just returned back from my trip to Hollywood, California. And while I was there, I got an inside scoop to this very famous killer. I went to crime scenes, houses, and a very famous ranch where he and his followers lived. Yes, today we are going to be discussing part one of a cold-blooded killer and a very famous cult leader. Yes, we are going to be discussing Charles Manson, part one. Charles Mills Maddox was born on November 12, 1934 in Cincinnati, Ohio to his runaway mother, Ada Kathleen Maddox. Everyone called her Kathleen. Prior to Charles' birth in August of 1934, Kathleen married William Eugene Manson. Charles Manson would take his stepfather's last name later in life. Charles Manson was very neglected as a child and, and felt very just shunned. He always felt like his mother didn't want him. It was often said that his mother would go on drinking binges with her brother Luther, leaving Charles with sitters and sometimes alone. On August 1st, 1939, Luther and Kathleen Maddox were arrested for assault and robbery and sentenced to five to 10 years in prison. Charles Manson even made the comment about his mother and that his mother taught him only one thing is that everything out of her mouth was a lie. Charles Manson was sent to West Virginia to live with his aunt and uncle. It was said that Charles had a very loving childhood with his aunt and uncle. He felt loved, he had any and everything that he desired and he wanted to be there. He attended elementary school, he attended church, and it was said that while he was at church, that is when he fell in love with music. He loved watching people sing, he loved watching people play instruments, he became infatuated with the music, which is a great thing, music, music is awesome. And at the age of six years old, Charles Manson was being bullied by this boy, or he didn't like this boy. He, Charles got all of these little girls together and told these little girls to go beat up this little boy. And at recess, they did. The principal comes in, he grabs these little girls and asks these little girls, what's going on? They all said, well, Charles made us do it. He told us to do it. When the principal confronted six-year-old Charles Manson, he put his hands up. He said, oh, they did that, not me. They have a mind of their own. They didn't have to listen to me. So that's on them. So at only six years old, Charles Manson was very calculating and manipulative at just six years old. In the year 1942, Charles Manson's mother, Kathleen Maddox, was paroled. 
Charles even made the comment that the weeks after his mama returned from prison were the happiest times of his life. She was an incredible person, but she went back to her drinking days. And at just nine years old, little Charles Manson set his school on fire. Now, what would possess a nine-year-old to set his school on fire? So before the age of 10, Charles Manson was a very manipulative person. When Charles was only 13 years old, he was placed in a school for boys, a school for male delinquents, which was ran by Catholic priests. He was often beaten with a paddle and a leather strap. Charles Manson hated it there, but who wouldn't? He did not like being there. So what does Charles do? He runs away. He said he slept in woods, under bridges, wherever he can find shelter because he did not want to be there anymore. No one would. He said it was a horrible place. He did not like staying there. But his mother, Kathleen Maddox, found him and brought him back to the school. And once again, Charles Manson ran away. And this time, when he ran away, he committed his first crime in 1948 at the young age of 13 when he robbed a grocery store. Now, I'm going to pause right there, okay? He is 13 years old. He's already set the school on fire at nine years old. And now at only 13 years old, Charles Manson is robbing a grocery store. So he is already on the fast track to being a criminal at the age of 13, 13. This is crazy. At this point, everyone had had enough of Charles Manson. And in 1949, he was sent to Boys Town in Omaha, Nebraska, an another very strict school for boys. But after only four days, yes, four days, Charles Manson stole a gun, stole a car and left and robbed again. He was then sent to Indiana to a board school where allegedly Charles says that he was essayed and beaten by several of the boys there while an authority watched. Now, if this is true, this is very heartbreaking and sad that at only 14 and 15 years old, Charles Manson had to endure this type of abuse at a school, at a facility that was supposed to watch over him. And in 1951, Charles Manson escaped. And what does he do when he escapes? You think he's a good person, a good member of society? Oh no, he steals a car and he flees and just keeps on running and running and robbing gas stations. So a lot of you may be saying what I'm thinking. Well, if he keeps doing all of these bad things that's putting him back into these facilities, why doesn't he just start doing good so he can remain out of trouble and be a good person in society, in this world? But in reality, Charles Manson, in my opinion, had been in jail all his life. All he knew how to do was be a criminal. So all he knew in life was to steal cars, steal guns, rob gas stations, rob grocery stores. So he was doing what he thought he had to do to survive. Charles Manson had an IQ of 109 and was deemed antisocial when he was studied. In January of 1952, Charles Manson was caught essaying a boy at knife point. He was sent to a maximum security prison where he would remain until the age of 21. But due to good behavior, Charles Manson was released in 1954. In January of 1955, Charles Manson married Rosie Jean Willis. And later that year, Charles Manson and his pregnant wife, Rosie, arrived in Los Angeles, California. Later that year, on April 10th, 1956, Rosie gave birth to Charles's first son, Charles Manson Jr. But Charles Manson was always in and out of jail. And while Charles Manson was in, was in jail, his wife, Rosie, decided to leave him 
Charles was sent to prison for taking a stolen car across state lines. In November of 1958, Charles Manson was arrested for pimping a 16-year-old girl. That's how he was making his money. And he was also receiving money from another wealthy girl. This is how Charles Manson was making his living at the time. Charles Manson only knew how to commit crimes to make money. He didn't have a, a real job. And it was said that Charles was going to be released from prison in 1967 at the age of 32. And do y'all know what Charles Manson stated before he was released from prison? He said he was so comfortable in prison and thought of prison as his home that he didn't want to get out. That he thought that he was, he should remain in prison due to him being so comfortable in jail. And you also have to realize Charles Manson had been in jail all of his life, more than half his life. He was always in jail from a boy's home to a facility to a maximum security prison. He was always in jail and he felt so comfortable that he stated to everyone, guards, the parole, everyone, that he wanted to remain in jail, but they let this monster out in 1967. After Charles Manson's release from prison in 1967, he goes to San Francisco, California. And this is where he meets Mary Brunner. She is a graduate of the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and she is working as a library assistant at the University of California, Berkeley. She has a great job. Not long after meeting Charles Manson, he moves in with Mary. While Charles is living with Mary, he meets teenage runaway Lynette Form, AKA Squeaky. And we all know Squeaky. We all know Squeaky. I'm sure y'all have seen her. She's one of the Manson followers that tried to assassinate President Gerald Ford in Sacramento. She was really out there. I mean, she was a performer. She said crazy things. I mean, she was just all over the place. I've watched several documentaries on her and it was just wild. She was wild. Not long after meeting Mary, by the time she realized that she would get home and would have 18 women in her home. Charles Manson was moving all of these people into Mary's home. And what kind of people were they? Charles Manson would pray on the weak. He would pray on these runaway women or these weak women that had no social skills, that were troubled, that had family problems, that didn't know where to turn in life, that had ran away from home and lived on the streets. Charles Manson would bring them into his world and make them one of his followers. They even got this bus this old school bus, they would drive around in it. They lived in LA, they lived in Malibu, they lived in Venice, anywhere along the coast, they would travel in this old school bus, he and all his followers, which eventually became the Manson followers. All these women loved Charlie and they would do whatever he says. And on April 15, 19, 68, Mary Brunner gives birth to Charles's second son, Valentine Michael Manson. Around this time, Charles Manson started making his followers consume the drug LSD, which they all did. Charles Manson would consume the drug as well, but would always consume less of the drug. Why? Because Charles Manson wanted to stay on a level above his followers. He didn't want to fall too much into the trends of LSD. He wanted to stay level. He wanted to be more focused than his followers were. He was very smart. He was very powerful. He was very charismatic, very charming. He knew the, what to say, what to tell people. And he wanted everyone to follow him. And that is why he called his people, his followers. 
By 1968, Charles Manson had dozens of followers. I can name several. Charles Tex Watson, Susan Atkins, Leslie Van Houten, Patricia Cranwiggle, Squeaky, Linda Kasabian. I mean, I, I can go on and on. He had several followers that would follow him everywhere and listen to everything he says. Charles Tex Watson was born in Dallas, Texas, and he was a great guy. He was good looking. He was charming. He was a captain of his football team. He set the highest record for hurdles. He attended the University of North Texas where he was in, involved in a fraternity. He was just the golden boy. But in the 60s, he decided to go vis visit one of his friends in Los Angeles and became obsessed with LA in the 60s. Now you'll have to remember, LA in the 60s was wild and fun. I mean, it was all about hippies, free love, peace. Everyone's having fun. They smoking grass. They listening to music. They're dancing. It's just a crazy fun life in California at that time. And Tex loved it. While Tex was driving in LA, he picks up none other than Beach Boys Dennis Wilson. He drives Dennis to his home. Dennis invites him inside. And guess who's living in the Beach Boy Dennis Wilson's home? Charles Manson and his followers. And that is where Tex Watson meets and becomes involved with the Manson families. And I know what y'all are all saying. Why are hippies and homeless people like the Manson family living in a legendary's home like Dennis Wilson from the Beach Boys. I'm going to tell y'all. On a beautiful spring day in Malibu, California, on April 6, 1968, Beach Boy Dennis Wilson was driving through Malibu when he spotted two pretty girls hitchhiking. They were Patricia Cranwinkle and Ella Jo Bailey. Dennis decides to pick up these two beautiful girls and brings them to their destination. Just a couple of days later, Dennis Wilson spots the same two pretty girls hitchhiking on April 11th, 1968. But this time, Dennis does not bring the two pretty, girl, pretty girls to their destination. He brings the girls to his home on Sunset Boulevard. Now I'm gonna pause right there. I saw this home, I looked up this home. This was a gorgeous home on Sunset Boulevard. Okay, these girls were living it up when they arrived at Beach Boys, Dennis Wilson's home. And I'm gonna tell you all a little bit about who Dennis Wilson is. Dennis Wilson was a drummer for the Beach Boys and we all know the Beach Boys, I mean, who doesn't? California Girls, Help Me Rhonda, Kokomo, my personal favorite, God, God Only Knows. I love the Beach Boys. I'm a huge fan. Everyone loves the squeaky clean Beach Boys. They were just great with their little cardigans and their pants and their little crew cuts. I mean, they were the it boy band of the 50s and 60s, let me tell y'all. Dennis Wilson brings everyone to his home. He sees these two pretty girls. He's partying, probably drinking, maybe doing a little bit of drugs, doing whatever they gotta do. They're hanging out, they're having fun. Dennis Wilson has to leave to go to a recording session and leaves the two girls at his home. While he is at this recording session, he records songs, he drives back up to his home, and guess who meets him on his driveway? None other than Charles Manson. Dozens of people had arrived at Dennis Wilson's home and were living there, just moved in. Charles Manson and Dennis became good friends. They started talking and Dennis was at first okay with everything there. All these girls were, were, were at his disposal. Maybe he had drugs and alcohol, but he did what he had to do because he liked being at home with all these girls and Charles Manson and all these followers. But did Dennis Wilson actually want this at his home? Charles Manson claimed that he had met Dennis Wilson in San Francisco while Charlie was buying marijuana at someone's house. And he stated that Dennis Wilson and he had became friends and Dennis had informed Charles Manson that if he was ever in LA, that he should stop by his home if he was ever nearby. 
This is what Charles Manson has claimed and stated. Dennis Wilson and Charles became very close friends. Dennis even nicknamed him the wizard and was very intrigued by Charles Manson and his followers. And why did Charles Manson want to become friends with the squeaky clean beach boys, Dennis Wilson? Well, as we all know, Dennis Wilson had connections to the music industry. And I'm going to tell y'all this. When Charles Manson was in jail in the 60s, he heard the Beatles for the first time. And he was more interested in music. Charles Manson always loved music, as, told, as I told y'all earlier in this video. But at this time, when he heard the Beatles, he, he just grew crazy about music and wanted to sing and wanted to play the guitar. And in my opinion, he didn't have a bad voice and he could write songs. Dennis Wilson knew that Charles Manson wanted to be a singer and a performer. While Charles, Charles Manson was at the home of Dennis Wilson, they would smoke, they would drink, they would go into swimming pools, they would have fun. It was the 60s, y'all. Everybody had a wonderful time. They were doing anything and everything. Before Dennis Wilson knew, he had dozens and dozens and dozens of people living at his home. And it was said that the girls were treated as servants to all the men. Dennis Wilson had two things at his disposal, women and drugs. And who supplied these things? Charles Manson. Dennis Wilson introduced Charles Manson to his friends in the music industry, such as people called The Birds. The Birds were an incredible band back in the 60s. They had several hits such as Turn, 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 and my personal favorite, Mr. Tambourine Man. They also introduced Charles Manson to legendary music producer Terry Melcher, who was the son of actress and singer Doris Day. Terry Melcher was a genius in the music world, almost as good as the killer Phil Spector. Terry Melcher had 80 hits in just a short amount of time that he was a music producer. Charles asked Dennis if he could perform for Terry Melcher, which he did. He sang, played the guitar. Dennis Wilson met Charles Manson and his followers, but he was not impressed. He did not think that Charles Manson had, had what it took to be in the music industry. He also said, I just don't know what I would do with you, Charles Manson. So I just don't think, in my opinion, that Terry Melcher wanted to be involved with Charles Manson or his followers because Charles Manson could sing and could write songs, but maybe Terry Mel Melcher knew Charles Manson wasn't right in the head. Something was off. Charles Manson wrote a song and Dennis Wilson performed it with the Beach Boys. The song was originally called Seas Not To Exist. But Dennis Wilson changed the song to Never Learn Not To Love You. And in the album, the song was solely credited to Dennis Wilson, not Charles Manson. And of course, as it, as it would, anyone else, it would as well. Charles Manson was enraged. He was so upset that Dennis Wilson would do this to him. They would change the words of his songs and not even give him credit for the song. But Charles Manson needed Dennis Wilson. He wanted to make it in the music industry and knew that the only way he could was to stay in touch with Dennis Wilson and Terry Melcher. It was said that Dennis Wilson wanted his Beach Boy friends, his band, to meet Charles Manson and the followers. So Dennis Wilson invited the Beach Boys to a dinner one night. And one of the Beach Boys stated that while he was at this dinner, this sexual orgy, something in that nature started. And it wasn't his thing. So he excused himself politely to go take a shower and go to bed. While he was in the shower, Charles Manson swung open the shower curtain and said, you can't do that. He, the Beach Boy said, excuse me? He said, you can't leave the group. That is when 
that Beach Boy said he knew Charles Manson was a very evil human being at that point. He wasn't right in the head. Dennis Wilson started to distance himself from Charles Manson and the family. He even moved out of his own home to get away from Charles Manson and the family. It was said that Charles Manson and his followers destroyed two of Dennis Wilson's luxury cars. Three weeks before Dennis Wilson's lease were, were to expire on the home, the Manson family were kicked out and evicted. Dennis Wilson wanted absolutely nothing to do with Charles Manson or his followers. It was also said that Charles Manson left a bullet with Dennis, Dennis Wilson's housekeeper and a threatening message. You see, Charles Manson was devastated and enraged and so angry that Dennis Wilson not only changed the words to his song, but gave Charles Manson absolutely zero credit. Everything in Dennis Wilson's home was stolen. All of his property, all of his possessions were stolen by Charles Manson's families. So Dennis thought maybe in his head that he didn't owe Charles Manson anything. They took so much from Dennis Wilson that Dennis Wilson maybe said to himself, I'm not going to give you anything for this song. You took over my home. You stole my possessions. You stole my property. And you just moved into my home like it was yours and just made yourself at home for months, for months. I'm talking like six months. They just moved into his home, but he was done. Terry Melcher also stated that Dennis Wilson was so scared and said that he thought the Manson family, he was calling them killing people. That was, that's what he thought they were. They were people that would kill people. He was that freaked out by the Manson families that Terry Melcher said that Dennis Wilson made the comment. He didn't even want to live anymore. He was so freaked out by Charles Manson. Charles Manson had became such a big part in Dennis Wilson's life that Dennis Wilson was scared that Charles Manson was going to hurt him in some type of way. So he wanted to completely distance himself from Charles Manson. But that wasn't easy because Dennis Wilson knew that Charles Manson would maybe find him. And he also was nervous due to that bullet and threatening message that was left for him. Dennis Wilson was very frail, very, very fragile, and didn't know where to turn. And Terry Melcher and the birds and the Beach Boys, no one wanted to be affiliated with Charles Manson or his family. So Charles Manson moved to Spawn Ranch with his family, and they helped the owner of the ranch with horses and feeding and keeping up the place in return for not having to pay any money. It was also said that several of the Manson family, the, the women, would sleep with the owner of the ranch. Do I think that's true? Yes. I think Charles Manson had these girls doing pretty much any and everything that he wanted. My final thought, you know, I always give y'all my final thought. My final thought on part one of Charles Manson is, I do believe that Charles Manson was starting to make his followers believe at this point that he was some form of God. And they believed everything that he said, everything that he did was right. Everything that he said was right. Anything he wanted, they would do. It was also said that Charles Manson would make his followers perform these sexual acts, these sexual orgies. And you couldn't sleep with anybody that Charles didn't want you to sleep with. You couldn't do anything that Charles didn't want you to do with other men or women. Everything had to be run by Charles Manson first. And he would make his women go out and dumpster dive for trash, for garbage, for things to eat. And it was also said that these girls would perform sexual acts for different people, for money, for food, for drugs. And all of these women, men as well, believed everything Charles Manson was saying. They thought this was the way to go. But in reality, Charles Manson was poisoning his followers' minds. 
making them believe different things and acting on different things by saying to his followers, would you love me? Yes. Would you marry me? Yes. Would you have my children? Yes. Would you die for me? Yes. And finally, would you kill for me? And they said, yes. It didn't happen overnight, y'all. It did not happen in one, two, three nights. This was a long period of time that Charles Manson poisoned the mind of his followers, made him them believe what he was doing and all these songs that he was performing, all these people that he was bringing by. He was making his followers believe in his word. His word was the right, right word. And everything that he said was the right way. And his followers were so weak and so scared and most of the time high on LSD, that they didn't know what was going on. But Charles Manson knew exactly what he was doing. He was slowly starting to manipulate his followers. And I'm gonna give y'all more on the next two videos because I found out so much more when I was in LA. New details, things that I had never even heard of that Charles Manson did. And the places that he went, I visited. The places where he would sit and play his guitar and sing for his followers, where his followers would go to a murdering school, as he called it, where they would shoot guns and trees. These places that Charles Manson sat, I was there. And I'm gonna tell y'all even more and more with each passing video that I put out this week of Charles Manson. I want y'all all to remember to stay safe, Always be aware of your surroundings. Always know that I'm here for you. And remember as always, thank you for watching my video. And don't forget to like this video. And if you want, you can like, subscribe, and comment. And don't forget to press on that notification bell so you never miss a video from me, and marie And as always, thank you for all the love and support. And for you, I am truly grateful. And I love you all. And I hope I see y'all tomorrow night with Wicked Wednesday with part two of Charles Manson. Because it is going to be another scary, bumpy ride. Hope y'all have a good night. I'll see y'all tomorrow. Bye.